Um, I get to start off the event and I really do appreciate that opportunity on behalf of the Motion Picture Association and the studios that we represent. Um, the Chinese market continues to grow. Um, of course, you're seeing all the negative media out there, but uh, the statistics I'll put before you today will clearly demonstrate that. It is um, certainly leading with new ideas, new innovations online, as well as the way they distribute their films through the traditional methods and new methods that we'll hear about today from leading speakers who are here. Um, and these ideas are, are not necessarily unique to China, but certainly people can listen and learn and think of the application they could have on a global basis. Um, and for us, um, the quality US product continues to get into the marketplace. Um, there has been no slowdown on our ability to release films into China. Um, of course, we hear you know, all the negative rhetoric that's going on. But what I want to say is that Asia is happening. Um, Crazy Rich Asians, for example. Um, always think of you a little bit when I hear that, Janet. <laughs> Um, it's got a release date in China, um, and we're really excited by that opportunity, and I know the audiences in China will love that movie the way that audiences have it here in America and around the world. Um, so terrific, terrific news. Um, also, we have a whole lineup of films that are coming out between now and the end of the year um, in China. The House with the Clock in the Wall comes out November the 1st, uh, Nutcracker in the Four Realms, November the 2nd, uh, Venom on November the 9th, Fantastic Beasts, um, November the 16th, Ralph Breaks the Internet, November the 23rd, and Aquaman in December the 7th. A great range of the types of product that Hollywood produces, and all of them have confirmed release dates um, in China. Um, the studios, again, are, are very excited by the opportunity, and I know that the audiences in China can't wait to see the diverse offerings that we have to give them. Um, so how has the box office done in China so far? Well, it's up 10.7% a year on year. That market continues to grow. Um, and we participate in that market. Again, you'll hear some negativity about our share of it has dropped down. Um, it drops down and goes up in markets all over the world. It cannot continue to grow in every market. It depends what products are, are, we are offering, and it depends bluntly what else is on offer there for the consumers to see. Um, in terms of... Um, China and where it, it's going to rank in the world. Um, last time I put up a slide here a couple of years ago, I had a 15 to 20% growth. The growth rate has slowed down, and on that growth rate, it's probably going to surpass America by the year 2020. That's assuming America doesn't grow. And as we're seeing this year, uh, audiences have warmed to the films that are on offer here in America. And um, I think that will be a moving feast, but right now um, it should get equal with, if not surpass, America by the year 2020. I think, you know, again, that will change year on year, but it just shows how important that marketplace will be. And once it overtakes America, there is no question that it will continue to grow. Um, in China, there are a number of major titles that do incredibly well. Um, and some of the biggest films certainly um, are not necessarily the Hollywood films. Uh, fast, uh, fast, uh, the uh, Fate of the Furious in 2017 did incredibly well. Um, and of course, buoyed a little bit by the screen count that was up. But there were seven films that did more than 1 billion RMB. Four Chinese, three imported films. And, and these were added to the all-time rankings in China. Um, films which um, knocked it out of the ballpark um, recently have been Monsters Hunt 2, um, which, which did incredibly well, Detective Chinatown 2, Operation Red Sea in particular did incredibly well. And the numbers, I'm, again, from a time point of view, they're there on the slides and available to you. But those are big numbers happening in China. And one of the slides um, that I always like to pull together is, bluntly, how do our films do in China compared to the rest of the world? This year so far, there have been six films which did better in China than they did here in America. Um, and those films, again, are up there. Ready Player One, uh, Rampage um, did very well. Um, Skyscraper clearly did very, very well, 33% compared to 22%. And overall, the lion's share of the market from China and US and the world. And, and finally, um, The Meg, um, obviously um, incredibly well in China uh, and warmly received um, here in America as well. And I know that the studio was delighted by that. 
and the audience again just warmed to what was a, a terrific romp of a movie and I particularly enjoyed it as well. Um, of the US titles, Avengers um, kicked it out of the ballpark in China. Massive revenue, 181 billion in China. Um, you know, claims that the, the, the Marvel or fan based movies don't work in China. Clearly, they do. Um, you just need to have the right product, and that was obviously one that, that did very, very well. And um, certainly, um, the Meg um, has um, also found an incredible audience. Um, if you look at that number in China, but more importantly, worldwide. And um, obviously a model there, which I think, again, there's a presentation later today, and I won't dwell on that, but I'm looking forward to hearing exactly their thoughts on that, and bluntly how you replicate that, um, not just for you know, uh, the sequel, but how you take the learnings from that, and you see, can you apply that to films that you may have that want to be released in China. Um, so looking at the economic contribution numbers, this is the report that um, I will be launching um, today. You have on your seat the top line statistics here in English and in Chinese. Let me just run you through um, some of the top line numbers. This is a preview. The report itself will be officially launched later in the year, but you have the confirmed top line statistics here in this report. Um, the industry, the film and television industry, so not just uh, film, contributed 108 billion US dollars to the Chinese economy in 2017. Incredible. Um, absolutely incredible. That represents um, an increase um, of 22 billion um, in terms of the overall economic contribution. Um, so an incredible increase over the last time we looked at these numbers. And the sector rose 25% in one single year. Um, so not just film, you saw the 10% growth, but you look at the other sectors, and I'll come on to those in a moment. Um, and supported 4.6 million jobs, up 14% year on year. So again, an industry that really does generate jobs in a, in a world where we're often seeing jobs shrinking in many sectors. This industry, if we get it right, people are needed to make films and the content and product, as well as ensure that they, they distribute them. Um, and so, um, you know, we, we are a major contributor to that market. And overall, um, and I, I use this in most countries, is we pay a lot of tax. The industry pays a lot of tax to support the government. So, you know, um, when I'm, certainly when I'm speaking to government, I, I make reference to that particular number. Um, the screen count um, in China, um, the third and fifth tier cities are the ones that saw a 40% growth. So the major cities, by and large, are sort of reaching saturation point, um, and maybe there'll be some consolidation there in the, in the years ahead. But outlying in those smaller cities are where the growth are, and... You'll hear from speakers today how a large percentage of the population has never even been to a cinema. You know, they simply don't have access to it, and there are going to be alternatives and options for them um, to see products that we have, have um, on offer. Um, but there has been a little bit of a slowdown in that growth, only, only natural. But through the first half of the year, the number of screens grew for over 4,847. And so there have been more screens added since then. It's normally at the end of the year when I do my count back and I see how many screens they added a day. And I think last year it was something like 23 screens a day. And when you think about that, it is just stunning when you look at how many screens get added every single day. It's a number, um, you know, whether it's a single digit or double digit, the fact it's getting added every day in China um, is unbelievable and, of course, helps drive the growth that we see in this marketplace. Um, in particular, um, the Spring Festival saw a terrific box office I mean, those third and, f third and fifth tier cities. Um, they were actually up 60% year on year over, 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 um, in, in those cities. And I think, again, we will continue to see the growth there. And one has to look at what type of films appeal to those outlying cities compared to the first and second tier cities. Um, you know, analysts will say that, of course, a simple storyline um, carries well into those smaller cities. And therefore, it's no surprise that Wolf Warrior 2 drew most of its audience from those lower tier cities, whereas our films did better in the major, in, in the major cities. Interestingly, uh, in the OTT space, um, we are seeing um, substantial changes. And when I talk about OTT, I talk about subscription video on demand, advertising video on demand, online rentals, and we also include downloads to own. Um, and this part of the sector contributed 10.2 billion dollars. Absolutely huge. 
So opportunities to get your product into the marketplace and to the customer don't just rest with the theatrical business. This particular sector grew $6.7 billion um, from 2016, an increase of 191%, and it supported 430,000 jobs. So again, you know, we sometimes think about the online maybe reducing jobs. You still need people. You've still got to advertise it. I was with um, an industry player recently who got a new startup, and they've got 100 people that are involved in marketing and getting their product out there, and they're a startup. So, you know, again, just when you think digital, it doesn't mean no people, but you can obviously meet, reach a mass population. Um, in terms of the OTT market, I thought I'd take a, a, a bit of a snapshot. The data is all, all up there. Let me just quickly sort of walk you, walk you through it. Um, 800 million people online. Incredible opportunity, incredible consumer base, if you have the right product and the right way to get that product to the customer. Um, and theatres, as I say, are not, of course, it's, a, it's the launching board for many films, but there are many other ways that you can get the product there. Um, and of that, Tencent and Aichi Yi have the majority of the market share, two incredibly dynamic companies that are, are, have grasped this part of the business and really brought it to the consumer, where the average subscription is $2 per month. Um, total number of views... Um, in terms of a web series, went up to 76 um, billion views, up 300% from the year 2016. Um, so, you know, just fantastic numbers. And the quality product that are being produced by Tencent and Aichi Yi and Yuku are also growing as well. Um, and we can expect to see inter international production companies are looking at television co-production to work around the restrictions that we're seeing coming into play for foreign content um, to get on the broadcast TV and online video platforms. As long as um, a market improves, we'll see measures that come into play. And of course, there are ways that you can navigate your way through that. Um, and I think some of the people who'll be speaking today and people I, I look at out there in the audience um, who live in China as much as I do um, know that you can navigate your way through. It's difficult, it's complex, but with the right vision and the right partners, and the right advice, and um, you can be in that marketplace and taking a share of that market. Taking a deep, deeper dive, looking at Aichi Yi, uh, one of obviously the leading online video platforms, um, they made headlines in September um, in terms of the diverse ways in which they're going to be reaching and innovating. And they have over 500 million monthly active users. And um, the program includes, of course, music, reality, TV shows, um, as well as film. Um, the rap of China and the China, and the, and the China, China crime drama, Burning Ice, uh, reaching great audiences. Um, they also announced, and this is pretty interesting, a short video app called um, Jinxie, uh, aimed at the massive aging population in China, set to rise um, to 487 million people by the year 2050. And um, the app features short clips on how to deal with difficult family relationships and how to eat a healthy a healthy diet. So again, looking at social benefits to bring to their massive consumer base. And they also signed a deal with India's Eros to bring Bollywood blockbusters to China. Um, and again, they, we can expect to see about 100 movies in that deal coming through. Um, they also have signed deals with Netflix and shows like The Black Mirror and Stranger Things are available day and date with the rest of the world. Um, and then um, a feature called The Blizzard is Aichi Yi's latest foray International, into, into the international film market. Earlier this year, ITE expanded its partnership with H Collective, a Hollywood production company, under, and under the agreement, ITE will co-produce or invest in six feature films to be distributed both um, in America and the Chinese markets, and I expect, of course, other markets around the world. Um, they also are, in, and for me, uh, you know, an area that I work in is protecting the content. Obviously, I do a lot about promoting it, but we do a lot about protecting it, and IG at the forefront of bringing litigation actions in China to protect the content that has been stolen. Uh, we're very thankful that, again, other industry players, in particular Chinese ones, are stepping forward. And as the great Jack Valenti said, if you don't protect what you own, you own nothing. Um, and they are certainly out there protecting it. And um, they also have um, a fabulous series, the story of Yanshi Palace, um, which has an exclusive online distribution rights and is um, you know, um, getting incredible compensation coming through for them. 
Um, looking at the future, the founder um, who has been here, I know, to th this event, Gong Yu, um, is really, in his vision, and uh, I'm just quoting what he's talking about, is talking really about transitioning from an internet era to an AI era, where users will no longer need to search for content. Um, they would be fully, fully tailored to individual profiles. And as we know in China, I think people's profiles are probably better known than they are in America. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what innovative AI technologies come into play there that align with the government's vision of what your profile should be online. Can't wait to see what happens in that space. Um, and he predicted an evolution really in that AI business and the opportunities that they have for doing business and obviously reaching consumers, making money. At the end of the day, you know, this is a business where everybody wants to make money and, of course, more money. Um, interestingly, in China, more than 80% of tickets for movie theaters are now actually bought online. So um, one of the piece of research that I came across, which we are fully behind support, and I, I, I talked about it in Shanghai at the Shanghai International Film Festival, is the China Movie Industry Research Report. Um, if you go to the MPAI website, you can access a link and download it. Uh, there's an English summary that we have there, and this gives you a snapshot that will, I think, mirror some of the statistics we have, but actually do a bit deeper dive into some of the areas. And I commend that report for you to take a look at. Um, I've met with the, uh, the authors on a number of occasions, and they intend to make this an annual report. Um, and again, we will be engaged with them to make sure um, that, like myself, even though I, I speak Chinese, I can't read or write Chinese, so a, a booklet in Chinese isn't much use to me, but to make sure that you have access to the information there in English so you have a better visibility as to what is happening in that market. And when you take those statistics and our statistics together, um, again, the opportunities that are in China will, of course, be, be there. Um, and then looking, I talked about the over 80% of movie tickets are, are sold online. Uh, Mao Yan and uh, Tao Piao Piao control over 80% of the marketplace. Um, you know, and I, uh, you know, I'm looking obviously at that because that will provide incredible statistics and a way, of course, uh, for the government to audit um, the actual people attending the cinemas and one would hope ensuring that the content owners get paid their money. Um, so I think uh, online ticket sales can be um, obviously reaching an audience, but more importantly, providing access to the consumer that will benefit everybody. And it cannot be understated the influence of the e these e-commerce platforms um, and the relationships they have in getting the product to marketplace. Um, it's certainly a practice where the Chinese market has led the world and now other markets are looking to China to learn and to adapt into their own marketplaces. And I think you will see a little bit more of that. It's easy to crystal ball gaze, but I think, you know, um, here we exchange ideas and knowledge. But what's happening in China are, are ideas that can transition out of China, and, and certainly in the technology side, and how um, the audience um, obtains their movies. So um, finally, in wrapping up, um, you know, I am obviously upbeat. The statistics certainly tell you that. Um, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric out there about the decline of the industry and what's happening. And I think certainly next year could be a very, very interesting year. Um, in my conversations with local industry, um, they are looking at, at taking a different approach to the marketplace. Um, it's interesting the restructure that's happened uh, with propaganda looking out over the China Film Administration. Um, but what is clear from an American perspective is our films, and, as well as all international films, continue to be welcomed there. Um, there has been no slowdown um, in the ability to get our films in. And, uh, you know, I can certainly speak for our, our studios that we get paid, and we get paid on time. Um, but that's not to say that the problems that we have in China don't prevail. You know, difficulty sometimes with the, um, the periods where our films don't get released. We call it a blackout period. Um, the Chinese will call it something else, but they continue. Um, the inability sometimes um, to get clear release date, so you can plan your marketing and distribution around that, still prevail. Um, slow censorship process certainly applies, but not just to us, but also to local industry as well. Um, and it's not my intention today here, but I'm sure that people um, are interested in what's happening with the MOU and the audit, so I'm not going to say anything on that, but I'm happy to have a coffee with you later and give you an update. Of course, the MOU, a US government-led issue, nothing to do with the MPA. Uh, 
says he, smiling brightly. Um, and the audit. Um, audits take place everywhere in the world. That's nothing unusual. They're confidential, they're private, and we're delighted that in China this is becoming part and parcel of normal business there, um, which ultimately will put more money in the consumer's pocket. And at the end of the day, um, this is a business where um, I think China certainly looks to America to understand how you make your money, how you keep your money, and how you're allowed to invest it anywhere in the world. Um, with that, um, again, I, I will be here the whole day. I'm looking forward to the presentations. I come to these events myself to um, get educated, meet my friends, and really learn what, what is also happening here in America. Um, so again, I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for listening. And um, please take a look at the, uh, the numbers. They're good numbers. Thank you very much.